You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Christopher Moore on the show with me today to talk about his brand new book, Razzmatazz. And uh, this is such a fun book. Uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of darkness in the world uh, in the in the recent past. And, uh, you know, being able to read something that is so much fun. Uh, is, is just a breath of fresh air uh, right now. So uh, welcome to the show, Christopher. Hey, thanks a lot, Hank. Uh, Chris, before we get started, uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? My first memory of actually wanting to be a writer goes back to – probably I, I want to say sixth grade and I was I was reading um, I, I'd always been an avid reader um, and I was reading Ray Bradbury and in the short story form it was really pretty evident that there was craft and it was like oh wow there's somebody behind this right and um, and I thought man I would love to do that and I and of course did it in um school assignments and stuff. And I would sort of, I, I was doing then actually what I sort of do now, which was just rewriting um, myths and that I had been reading about, you know, like Greek myths and stuff and uh, writing them into a modern day context. And, and so th th that was, uh, you know, for school assignments. And I think my teachers always like, you know, that was really more than we were asking for, but um <laughs> You know, it, it it was something that, and also I read a lot of Mad Magazine at the time, so I was sort of uh, in. I had satire ingrained into me, so you know, because they retold all the uh, popular movies at the time, and they just made fun of news and everything else. And and uh, I I had been an avid reader of Mad Magazine for years, even when I was in sixth grade. So it was just my natural proclivity to go toward uh, satire and parody. That's uh, I, I also was an avid reader of Mad Magazine uh, you know, in those formative years, uh, especially I don't know. I, I first discovered Mad Magazine when I was maybe 11 or 12, and mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of the humor I know went just right over my head, um, you know, which which is the um, which is the hallmark of great art, I guess, when when um, it, it, when you're at one age, it means something to you. And then as you age, you you then start realizing the context. You're like, oh, I wish I would have understood what was going on then. But, you know, and then you get to enjoy it all over again. And uh, it, is that is that one of the things that that drew you to um, uh, to satire, that, that it was so multi-layered? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think it's something that I have endeavored to put in my own work for a long time is, you know, there's a lot of references, either historical or or cultural um, or literary in, in my work going back. But I, I always have tried to write stuff that it didn't require that you got the reference to Milton or Shakespeare or uh, um, anything that was happened to be uh, you know, culturally or politically relevant to the time. For one, anything that's that's really uh, timely and, and 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 relevant to to the time doesn't last on the shelf very long. So you have to really address more uh, universal concepts or or uh, of what you're trying to make fun of if there's going to be if it's going to last. I at the time I didn't. Uh, I th I don't know if I thought about this. I made a couple of uh, references, I think, in my early books to like the Reagan administration and stuff like that, but without naming it by name. Um, and uh, so the so the the multi-layer stuff 
uh, that comes within you know what I use for source material and how much I make references to to literary passages and so forth. But but also in trying to keep it, I guess abstract enough is the right word that you don't have to get any of the references. You don't have to be of a time to um, to know you know to to appreciate what's funny, and and that also uh, sort of motivates me to to write stuff that's funny on every level that I'm capable of doing. You know, from from perhaps uh, you know the, the the highest level of rhetoric that I can make humorous to uh, just as much as I can get physical humor into a into a uh, written the written form. You know, which which is tough, uh, but early on I, ha I kind of had to do that for uh, for my second book. I had to make things funny um, without them being rhetorical because I was writing a Coyote Blue about the, the Native American trickster god Coyote, and he's not a particularly articulate fellow, but he's very funny. And, and a lot of what makes him funny is what he does physically, so I had to sort of teach myself to do that. So yeah, I, I've been aware of the layers of it, but, but quite honestly, when you start out, you just want to be able to get it on the page and, and write the end. You know, yeah, right. And, and the rest of it is, you know, uh, um, the the rest of it, and get people to read the book from beginning to end. I was, I was, I'm, I've always been abundantly aware of of how much I have to earn the time of the reader, um, and, and so I, I always try to be aware of that without fulfilling what I have to say, you know, or or showing how clever I happen to be. When you're, uh, you know, the the old adage that is, uh, you know, um, doled out all the time to to writers is uh, show don't tell. And I, I guess when you're when you're dealing with a character that is uh, non communicative or is, um, uh, you know, or, or, or doesn't express themselves uh, very yeah, not, well, not articulate. I guess. Yeah, not articulate. Thank you. Um, that is that is the you then have to kind of epitomize show not tell in, at that point, don't you? You, you do. Um, you, you always have in, in any revelation of character, you always have the ability to have other characters who may be more articulate or may be more uh, uh, astute uh, to comment on the character, even by observation. You, know, you can do change point of view and I'm already getting into the weeds. We're not even five minutes in. Um, but you can change point of view and you can look at a character who's simple like Coyote or or Grendel or in Beowulf or something like that. And, sure. and you can get a sense of that non-articulate character. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 it was particularly, I mean, I when I started to do Coyote, I didn't realize I'd be facing that. And it was my only my second book. But uh, you know, so everything was new. It wasn't like, oh yeah, I have a complete pattern on how I do this, and now I'm going to have to learn a new thing. It was like everything I learn is basically new, except the chapter numbers. Um, but uh, it, it it it's a challenge uh, to to write physical comedy in in, in prose, um, and make it work. And uh, you know, so so you just you teach yourself your craft as you go along. You realize that a lot of what's going to be funny may be just your choice of verbs um, and it, you know, those words that sound funny and so forth. And and that's not a goal. It, you know, everybody's goal is not to write funny books, but mine happens to be. So, so yeah. it, it, you, you try to find all the different ways to uh, ev evoke a smile in your reader. Sure. In 1992, you published Practical Demon Keeping, your first book. Uh, mm -hmm. Was that the first book that you had written? It was. It was the first book I had finished. I had written um, some pretty glorious chapters one and two. Um, and then I <laughs> as, would, as most writers have. <laughs> yeah. And then I would rewrite them, you know, ad infinitum, and then I would never get to chapter three or four. Um, and so when I, when I set out to write practical theme keeping, I, I told myself I'm not going to rewrite a word until I'm finished with the first draft. 
and I'm sure that that was advice I got from some writing teacher along the way um, at, a, at a workshop or something. But I had tried everything else and I hadn't gotten the book finished. And uh, so that's what I did. I wrote the whole thing by hand on you know, writing tablets in a, in a, a diner at the counter because I didn't have a place for a desk where I was living. And uh, I would never go back more than about a paragraph uh, to rewrite anything. And so, and so I just made notes in the margins. OK, go back and change, you know, Robert's last name in chapter three, that kind of stuff. Or, you know, you're going to have to set this up so that when I actually went to to rewrite it and, and put at that point, it was just put it into a computer. Um, I could fix those things um, in retrospect. And by the end of the book, I'd forgotten the characters last names and I would just, you know, put a line um, after their first name if I needed it and, and so forth. But uh, the whole goal was just getting it done, and, and it really was my first novel. I'd written short stories before I published, I think, one. Um, but, uh, but you know, I knew I'd never be able to make a living as a writer if I didn't write novels, so that was that was really the goal. That, that's very interesting to me that, that up until that point you had not finished a novel, but you came to the realization – that you had to stop dinking with it and you just had, you had to get through and, and leave yourself notes. Uh, what, what was the realization that you came to? Um, you, you know, there, there comes a point where you realize, um, uh, you know, I can edit a finished manuscript, but I can't edit, um, you know, this, this kind of, uh, forever work in progress, you know, it's that I have to get something finished so that then I can go back and make it better. Um, wh what was that realization like for you? Um, I think it, it, like many things when you're, when you're starting out, I think it was just, uh, taking a leap of faith. And, and as I said, I kind of tried everything else and, and I knew I need to finish a book. You know, your first book, you can't write a proposal. They don't have, um, and then get a book deal because they don't know if you have any talent. You know, you have, you know, th their first question is going to be, well, can you finish a book? If you can finish it and then send it to us and we'll tell you whether we like it or not. And so I knew that question was always going to be there because my goal was not, you know, my goal became to finish a book because I had to finish a book in order to become a novelist and I had to become a novelist in order to make a living as a fiction writer. So, um, I, you know, I, I, the, and the revelation came to me, I think, with just turning 30 and not having had uh, very much success as a writer and realizing that, that a, a lot of it is I didn't have a material to be successful with, you know. Um, so so it, it, it wasn't a light going off. It was just basically I'd failed at everything else if the goal was being finishing a book. And so I thought, OK, I'm going to do sort of these old adages that I've been hearing for years, you know, write every day. And, you know, when you write, write, when you, when you edit, edit and, and don't do both. Although some authors really have, a, are very uh, successful at, you know, they start their day with editing the thing they wrote yesterday and then they go into the today and um, that didn't work for me. Um, so, uh, you know, like I said, it wasn't like a light bulb going off. It was like all the other light bulbs went out. And it was like, OK, you got to try this now. Um, and uh, and that was, you know, so so it was. It was revealed slowly to me rather than a, than a, sort of uh, a lightning bolt outside of Damascus. Looking back at your um, your back catalog, Christopher, a lot of your work is um, satire or kind of send ups of uh, of uh, supernatural elements or um fantastical elements or uh, legendary uh elements mm -hmm. uh, what is it uh what is it that intrigues you about these topics and 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 makes you want to kind of turn some of these things on their head and look at it a different way um i i think uh, you know as i said before it's something i've always done going back to you know when i first wanted to be a writer um, I, you know, I've always enjoyed myth and, and uh, legend and folk tales and horror stories and science fiction and so forth. And uh, even when, you know, when you would, when I would go to classics, it would be Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, not so much, you know, um, Jane Austen or, or uh, you know, 
Thomas Hardy or anything like that. It, it, it just was, um, it was what I grew up into. And, um, and I, I fancied myself originally a horror story writer. And I, I wrote uh, some horror stories to take to a writer's conference. I, I, my girlfriend at the time um, was in the early 80s. She said, well, there's this writer's conference uh, here in Santa Barbara, and you always said you used to write, so you should go to that thing. And I was like, okay. So I wrote some stories, and I took it to that thing. And I, in the workshops, I read my horror stories, and everybody laughed at them and in the way I turned a phrase. And I thought, well, I guess this is what I do. Um, and, and so it, it sort of became natural that I would uh, take those things that I enjoyed, you know, things with a supernatural element um, or fantastic element, and try and make them funny. And my, my goal with Practical Demon Keeping, uh, my first book, as I remember, you know, kind of sitting on, you know, in the living room with a friend of mine who was also a writer and, and saying, I want to do for horror what Douglas Adams did for science fiction. And and so that was my my goal, I guess. And, and I had some success with it. And so I thought, well, I'm going to keep doing that. And uh, here we are with 18 books later. <laughs> the, there's an always, I, I've always thought that there was an interesting connection between horror and comedy or, um, and, and I don't necessarily mean slapstick comedy, you know, but, um, uh, horror and, and a sort of wry humor, um, go hand in hand a lot of times. Um, why do you think that is? And, and why do you think that that has worked so well for you across so many volumes? Cough button. Um, uh, I think it's the, I think it's whistling in the graveyard. You know, I think that when you become uneasy, um, and full of tension that, that you, we all long to have the tension relieved. And, and so I think that's where the natural, uh, uh, I think that's, that's where the natural tendency to, to uh, equate comedy and, and horror. And I, I think that, um, it's such a relief. And also, you know, when you find yourself in a situation where the, I mean, you're faced with a werewolf or, a, you, know, a, uh, you know, a vampire or, or a, a sea monster or whatever the, you know, the various silly things that I've written about, um, it's absurd. And I try to write about normal people in extraordinary circumstances, just, you know, your, your average person on the street doing a job and then some weird thing happens to them and and you're naturally going to think this is absurd this is ridiculous and at some level it is and and it seems to be the only for me it's the only way that a sane person is going to react to something like a ghost is suddenly talking to you um or you know you're there's a sea monster there and you're and you're not you know immediately maybe in danger but you know you this is ridiculous and and so I, I think that that's it's certainly in my case that's where the humor comes from is just people being in an extraordinary circumstance and reacting with humor um, and uh, I, I guess I, I hope that answers your question I, I, yeah. it, it, I don't want to keep yammering on when <laughs> at the time I have things we never got over the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score, Bearded Bad Boy Barber Knox, refers to live his life the way he takes his coffee, alone, unless you count his basset hound Waylon. Knox doesn't tolerate drama even when it comes in the form of a stranded runaway bride. Naomi wasn't just running away from her wedding. She was riding to the rescue of her estranged twin to knock him out Virginia, a rough around the edges town where disputes are settled the old-fashioned way with fist and beer, usually in that order. Too bad for Naomi, her evil twin hasn't changed at all. After helping herself to Naomi's car and cash, Tina leaves her with something unexpected. The niece Naomi didn't know she had. Now she's stuck in town with no car, no job, no plan, and no home, with an 11-year-old going on 30 to take care of. There's a reason Knox doesn't do complications or high-maintenance women, especially not the romantic ones. But since Naomi's life imploded right in front of him, the least he can do is help her out of her jam. 
and just as soon as she stops getting into new trouble, he can leave her alone and get back to his peaceful, solitary life. At least that's the plan until the trouble turns to real danger. Things We Never Got Over, the new book by best-selling author Lucy Score. An Innocent Client, the first book in the Joe Dillard legal thriller series. A preacher is found brutally murdered in a Tennessee motel room. A beautiful, mysterious young girl is accused. In this best-selling debut, criminal defense lawyer Joe Dillard has become jaded over the years as he's tried to balance his career against his conscience. Savvy but cynical, Dillard wants to quit doing criminal defense, but he can't resist the chance to represent someone who might actually be innocent. His drug-addicted sister has just been released from prison, and his mother is succumbing to Alzheimer's. But Dillard's commitment to the case never wavers despite the personal troubles and professional demands that threaten to destroy him. Chosen by BookBub readers as one of the top 100 crime novels of all time, get started on this great series with an innocent client where it all started. Read for free with Kindle Unlimited or buy it in paperback or audiobook. An Innocent Client by Scott Pratt. Your your new book, Razzmatazz, um, I, I don't feel like we can effectively talk about that book without first talking about noir, um, because this is uh, a, a a continuation of sorts um, of of that book, Noir. Where where did where did that book and those characters come from? Um, I think it, it it really came from. It's, it's so common. It's so common. I, I, I had. I, I had. Um, I was when I was when I was decided. Decided after noir. I was more called Shakespeare for Squirrel. Um, um, the, the original. The original book that I had proposed, proposed was, to was to take my character Pocket, who is the fool, the fool from King Lear. I had previously written two books about him, um, Fool, which is King Lear retold from the fool's point of view, and uh, the Serpent of Venice, which is. Othello and the Merchant of Venice told from the point of view of this same fool who has gone to Venice. And um, so I wanted to write a, a story of a Midsummer Night's Dream with this same fool. Um, and the, the, the forest and Midsummer Night's Dream is can be anywhere. And that's one of the reasons I think that the play is so often – put on by high schools and all these different you know, community theaters is that you can just imagine it in any way. I've seen two or three that it's like a glam rock forest, um, one where it was a city dump and all the fairies were wearing uh, garbage bags. And what I thought is to, is to have this late medieval, early Renaissance uh, fool be transported to a, a forest that was like Golden Gate Park. And it was in the 1940s. And so everybody talked like tough guys, or 1930s, maybe, like tough guys in J- Jimmy Cagney and Humphrey Bogart movies. And, you know, all the fairies were like dames, you know, and um, or flappers or something like that. And he had to deal with the whole aspect of, you know, automobiles and radios and telephones and, and firearms and all the things that didn't exist in his time. And uh, and my publisher went, no, maybe not another Shakespeare book now. And I, yet I had done all this uh, research on San Francisco in the 1940s. And, uh, and so that, I thought, okay, well, I'll just do that part of the story and create a new cast of characters. So I did some more research and um, I found I wanted to set it in post-war San Francisco because there had been so many interesting cultural changes um, during World War II in San Francisco, where the, you know, the African American population um, went up 700 percent because of people coming to get jobs in the shipyards, and uh, you know the sort of uh, what's the word the elevation of the Chinese community um, after being really secondhand citizens, but how they uh, how the Chinese community set up these entertainment venues that were sort of plays on their own uh, stereotypes. And they had, uh, uh, I guess, Asian drag is a term I just made up, but they would have like uh, Chinese Andrew sisters, Chinese and uh, Frank Sinatra, 
you know, all these different Chinese entertainers um, in these clubs like the Sh Club Shanghai, which is where one of the characters works in, in the book. And, and, you know, that and the fact that the Japanese had been sent to internment camps and when they came back, Japantown was full of African-American uh, shipyard workers who had moved there because their houses were empty. And it was just a lot. There was a lot of dynamics uh, going on that I wanted to write about. And so I created characters sort of um, using noir tropes. Um, and and those those are in fiction noir like Jim Thompson. There's almost and James M. Cain. The heroine is almost the hero hero certainly certainly is almost always a working mug. And then some you know he's a guy that works the desk at a motel. And then some dame comes in and shakes his life up. So my main character was going to be a bartender at a bar that still exists in San Francisco and was busy in in you know 1947. And and I just sort of went down the line. A, a waitress who had been a uh, Wendy the Welder, you know, which is the shipyard version of Rosie the Riveter who worked in aircraft factories. Um, and now she works at the, the Woolworths lunch counter and uh, the drag king clubs, which was something I didn't know about until I did the, the research where, you know, women dress as men and they sing, you know, their Sinatra or Mel Torme or, you know, the entertainers at the time. So all of that were things that I thought would make an interesting uh, backdrop for uh for a book and and then as i researched it um i, I ran across and sometimes you just run across this some golden nugget and you know buried deep in google and and just you know putting san francisco 1947 into google something came back in like page five that the guy who had been the uh, commander at roswell new mexico uh, was in San Francisco in in the late spring of, of uh, 1947. And then, of course, the summer of 1947 is when the infamous crash happens at Roswell. And I thought, well, that's got to be in the book. <laughs> Obviously. The whole, UFO, the, the whole UFO phenomenon, I guess, just blew up in 1947 because of that and other things that had been going on in the country. So that's basically, you know, a bunch of interesting stuff thrown in a book, play a lot with tough guy language. You know, I had a lot of fun with language in that book, you know, reading Damon Runyon, who basically he wrote his hilarious stories from the 20s through the 40s with, you know, sort of these tough guy gangster guys in New York. And um, and then, you know, m most a lot of the dialect came out from films rather than from uh, from fiction because a lot of the guys that wrote uh, noir detective fiction were really good writers and they were really James M. Cain I think had a, a MFA in creative writing and from a prestigious university that lose me now but um, Raymond Chandler was a very good writer and they, they so they weren't uh, portraying their characters that much as talking in dialect the way that the, the guys writing for film were and so that was how noir came about and it's the story of you know, a group of sort of misfit friends post-war trying to get by in San Francisco. And um, I think that Razzmatazz, as you said, it's a continuation, but it's, I don't know that it's necessary to have read noir. I mean, I have to talk to somebody who hasn't read noir and re read Razzmatazz, but I, I think that it pretty much stands on its own and takes off from, from the first page. And then we, we sort of get filled in as you go along without, hopefully without, you know, sitting people down and going, okay, in our first episode, this is what happened. But, <laughs> right. So, Christopher, when you have, um, when you found a time period um, that has piqued your interest and you, you start identifying some of the unique um, uh, elements, uh, uh, the, the things that made up culture in this particular time. And then you start, you know, researching and you find interesting little historical tidbits like the, the Roswell connection. And, um, you know, uh -huh. the, there are all of these sorts of elements that, um, that start to develop plot and, and, you know, give the characters some sort of trajectory. Um, when does the writing actually begin the drafting let me let me rephrase that because because i do believe that the research and the the act of you know kind of immersing yourself in the story and thinking about it um those those things can be writing also um but then there comes a point where you sit down at the keyboard and you start drafting the novel um 
talk a little bit, if you will, about that transition from getting yourself prepared, getting yourself immersed in the time period, in the characters, in the events, and moving from there to the actual drafting of the story. I think uh, the there's there's writing going along as I create the characters and as I work on the characters all along, like even before I've you know put a structure on it, because you just uh, imagine situations, you know. And and this is a, a reason, one of the reasons I research these books, even though nobody's expecting to um, you know have to pass a test after they finish reading one of my goofy books. But I I try to get the historical stuff in because my default reaction is is humor it's a, i try to find something funny when i when i learn something new or I, that maybe that's just how i react and so by exposing myself to all this stuff that's new to me i i may uh i may end up going oh this is something that's funny that i can do with with that um from the character's point of view and I, i'll write you know dialogue scenes that will plug into the book later on which is really um a relief as you're writing in a long manuscript to go, okay, tomorrow I, you know, I'm on chapter 10, but this is the one where these guys talk about ice cream or something like that, that I wrote back when I learned about a certain kind of ice cream. So, so, um, but there is a point where I realize I just have to start writing the book. I've got enough. And, and, and that usually hinges on having an idea of having a, a beginning, a middle and an end that I may not know entirely how i'm going to get to the end but i i I have some idea what um what it's going to be and then there's signposts along the way i work in a timeline format more than an outline you know a sub paragraph b kind of thing and uh and so i'll have you know if, if you were looking at a ruler i'll maybe have i know what the beginning is and then about Two inches in, there's an event that happens, and and, and I, I I sometimes will use a three act structure, and if it looks like it's going to be a longer book, a five act structure, and that's almost never um, pointed out to the reader. The the act structure is usually for me. You know, I've I've always maintained that chapters are for writers; they're not for readers. They're so that you can divide up the enormous task of having to write a novel. It's like I'm gonna, I don't I only have to write a paragraph today or a scene today or a you know a chapter today i don't have to write 400 pages today um pardon me so uh it's uh, it so it really just becomes like a critical mass it's like okay i'm i've gone from researching to digging around you know i have what i need to get started and usually that that comprises the character who will also reveal themselves a lot as you start to make them talk um but but it, it's just a date that's arbitrary at, you know and and you know say i'm i'm just sort of goofing around and it's uh, but i have a, a basic structure of the book i don't not you know it's like i don't know what the interior of the museum of fine art in san francisco looks like so i can't write it no you just go ahead and start writing and 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 that's that goes back to our, our first discussion about, you know, fixing on the rewrite. There's right. there's more research that you do as you're writing, but it's kind of looking up to confirm things to see if you were wrong. You know, you look up stuff that could really change the the whole thrust of the book that because it's completely incompatible. You know, like if a certain technology hadn't been invented at that point and you're doing a historical, you can't have that in there. Um, so you look that stuff up before you start, but but there's other things, details that you know you fill in as you go along, and um, and and there's just a critical mass that you reach that you go. I have you know I have deadlines too, you know which I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not as good at letting blow by as some authors are, but um, so I try to hit them, and that means that I'm going to have to start writing a book, you know, probably 12 months before it's due. Um, sometimes it's later, sometimes it's earlier. When, when you begin writing the book, do you have an idea of the ending uh, or, you know, or is it uh, are, are you discovering it as you write? I usually have an idea of it and I, I really do. Uh, I do proceed on faith, to be honest with you, that I that 
you know, I've started books before that I didn't know how they were going to end. Um, and it's usually about 150 to 175 pages after you've just been thinking about this thing when you wake up and you think about it when you're going to sleep and you think about it when you're exercising. Um, and, and one of the things I've learned as, as a novelist is that you encounter fewer problems that stop you is if you when you're daydreaming or goofing off, if you're thinking about your book, you know, and I, I used to I swim for exercise and you can't read or watch TV or listen to music when you're swimming. You're basically it's black line, you know, black line, black line, breathe. Um, and and so I would if I was faced with some problem in narrative, I would just continually try to hit that problem as I was swimming and think about it again and again. And again. Your mind wanders, but you pull yourself back to it. And um, so so I think that uh, I, I think that living in the book is is how you get it finished and how the end occurs to you. But I very I mean, basically, with any story, you set up a conflict or a problem and the book ends when you solve that problem or you don't, you know, when the when the character resolves it or they don't. Um, so so the end is implied in the in the problem. If you don't have a conflict or a problem, then you've got more work to do. <clears throat> and sometimes that's not I mean, that that's just a, a framework. I mean, a razzmatazz is a murder mystery, but it, I, it probably doesn't occur to anybody that it's a murder mystery. They're not, you know, looking through it to go and who did it, who did it, who did it, because there's so much other weird shit going on through the whole thing. Right. Um, but but, uh, you know, so, you know, that being the case, if you know you're using a, a murder or a, a mystery framework, you know, the end's going to be we solve the mystery you know, for it to be satisfying for the reader. And <clears throat> the same way, you know, a, a book of mine like The Less Listener, Melancholy Cove, A Sea Monster Comes to Town. Um, the book's going to end when you get rid of the sea monster, you know, or you and or it's going to end with a new reality in which your town now has a sea monster. Um, you know, uh, it goes back to uh, the John Gardner book, The Art of Fiction, where he sort of does that pyramid that sort of isosceles isosceles triangle of you know the conflict causes the the one ray to go up and then you hit a a, a point of of what's the, what would what, the word be a, 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 of 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 zenith i guess of of the action and you resolve it and then the ray goes back down to the base and and you resume status quo and sometimes that's a new status quo Again, I know that's very wonky, but it is something that I've used for years. Um, which you know, because a lot of a lot of Gardner's books about fiction, they really assume that you're a literary, a writer of literary fiction, and I think that if you approach it that way, you might not always um, get your work done. You know, because you've tried to pick up the burden of literature, and that was certainly my case. But you know, you take. From any teacher, any instructor, any uh, any uh, how-to article, you take what you can use at the time. What you know, what you're ready to learn. I mean, I remember I had a, a great writing teacher uh, named Shelley Lowenkoff, who I took extension courses at UCSB and and workshops from. He taught full time at at USC in the professional writing program and. And he would say stuff to me that I really that didn't occur to me until five years later what he was talking about, you know. So you you, you learn at your own pace whether you know it or not, but you have to expose yourself to that stuff. If if uh, the 1947 Roswell incident was um, a and uh, in, uh, in the the connection that you uh, discovered to San Francisco, if that became the um, uh, a a, uh, a a sort of inciting incident, if you will, uh, that that brought noir uh, to life. Uh, was there a similar incident or or something that that kind of springboarded uh, Razmataz in, into uh, your your imagination? Well, I constructed it. One of the things that um, there's a certain I mean, after you have, I guess, a career, um, there are certain expectations that people have for your book. And, and 
And if I and, and I, I learned this in my my seventh book, which was Fluke, which is about marine mammal researchers. And the first half of the book is is there's weird stuff going on, but most of it is really the day to day life of people who study whales in Hawaii. And um, and I'd spent time with them. And when the book came out, I found out that there were people who really loved the first part um, or they really loved the second part where stuff gets really weird. Um, and uh, and I realized that there was an expectation that something weird is going to happen in my books and something supernatural or, or hyper scientific like aliens or something like that. And so I look I looked for that element for for noir. Well, in in Rasmataz, you know, it was it went a, from sort of pseudoscientific uh, aliens to um, more mythical. And, you know, San Francisco has the largest community of Chinese outside of China. You know, and I live three blocks from Chinatown. So I wanted to, you know, sort of explore you know, the Chinese culture a little bit more, the history of the Chinese in the West, and I wanted to bring some Chinese myth into it. And so what uh, what becomes the the, um, the driving supernatural element in Razmataz is a dragon. And so, you know, that the, the then your next, whenever you postulate something like that, it's like, now, how do I get a dragon to San Francisco um, in the modern era? And, and that that's, you know, so so rather than, oh, I found it and it was cool, it was I looked for it and I found it um, because I needed it because of who I am and what what, what my readers expect. You know, and when you're when you're just starting out, it's what you expect of yourself. And, and a lot of that um, is emulation. Um, and it wasn't my case anyway. I don't want to speak for anybody else, but a lot of it is what have you enjoyed in the past and what would you like to do with your own work? And so in practical demon king being, as I said, I wanted to do uh, for horror what what Douglas Adams had done for science fiction. And I, obviously I would have a different voice. I'm not English, and so I'm not allowed to use adverbs and stuff like that. Um, but uh, so, so in Razmataz, it was just looking for that element and finding it um, in Chinese myth. Starting with noir and now Razmataz, you have really um, built a world uh, that is so much fun um, where literally anything can happen. Um, are you planning more books uh, in this uh, quote unquote world and, and you know, in this timeline? Uh, will we see more stories from from here? Um, you know, I, I don't. I don't have anything planned, Hank, but I'm, I'm not close to it. I like the characters a lot. And one of the things that, that I've found over the years is that if I create characters that I like writing, then it's fun to go back and, and write more of them, you know? And I, um, so, so very often, I think in only one case, I've done a bunch of sequels or even committed trilogies. And um, but I haven't planned the second book and I didn't plan uh, Rasmataz, quite honestly. Um, among all the other things I mentioned, I, I wrote Rasmataz because, you know, we were in this plague and and um, this political plague and it was just everything was so dark and awful. And I just found it really hard to generate original uh, comic ideas, you know, and I thought, OK, if I don't have to build a world, then I can just concentrate on the story within the world. And so uh, um, in the past, that's been, um, I did, you know, early on, I, I wrote my first book because I didn't have any money to go anywhere to research. Um, um, and, and since then, there's been times when I've written books set in the same setting because I didn't have any money or there was a deadline on me and I didn't have time to research a new location um, because there's a lot of things even seasonal that'll affect uh, your research like when I did the whale book you had to go to to Maui in the winter time you know tough job but but it was you know if I was going to get that that book finished in time I had to be in Maui in you know the uh, late winter early spring months and and see how these scientists work and 
if I had waited then to hold the year in order to do that research, which I couldn't do. So, so with the pandemic and the Trump administration, all the horrible things that were going on in, in the country, I couldn't go anywhere to research. And I had already, I sort of knew this world and I live in San Francisco. Um, and it, and it largely looks like it did 70 years ago. So, uh, so that was, that that's a reason that I'll return and I and I would return again as I said I like I like the characters a lot and if the I, if there's a response to it if, if my readers like it a lot then I might go back well Rasmataz is so much fun uh and you know whether you choose to read Noir first and then Rasmataz or read them out of order you definitely should read both um and and I, like you said earlier I do think that Rasmataz stands on its own and and i i think you could read them in any order that you want but that there's so much fun uh razzmatazz is available everywhere now when you're hearing this you can run out and grab it at your local bookstore or we're going to have links to it where you can get it in kindle edition or uh is it going to be available in uh audible audiobook i'm 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 assuming that it will yeah johnny heller uh is reading it who did the first book and he's he's really terrific he does uh like one of the the characters Eddie Shu, uh, Johnny does in the voice of Jimmy Cagney, which a lot of readers won't know if they didn't watch, you know, 30s movies. But it it cracks me up every time I hear it. He does a great job of with, with the the 40s dialect, the 40s tough guy dialect. So it will be on Audible um, on the same day that it's released. So much fun, uh, Christopher. If people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that that you're up to, and uh, you know go through your massive back catalog uh where can they find uh you online and and dig into all the stuff you do uh chrismore.com uh will get you in the door um i have a twitter feed which is the author guy um it's distinctly uh obscene and probably more political than it should be and um i i I'm on Facebook, I think, as the author guy, or you can just uh, put in Christopher Moore and find me. I'm less active on Facebook because everybody is um, mad all the time. And uh, <laughs> so I just put kind of announcements up there. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm out there. I mean, the, the first thing that should come up if you just Google Christopher Moore is, is uh, chrismore.com. And... Uh, there's a bunch of other Christopher Moores who are authors, so if there's an initial after Christopher, it's probably not me. Um, and I, you know, so I don't live in Thailand as one of the Christopher Moores, and I'm not a Canadian sociologist as another Christopher Moore, and I'm not an African American guy who writes Christmas books who's another Christopher Moore. So I'm the one that <laughs> at ChrisMoore.com. Excellent. We'll. Uh... Be sure to send people uh, there to find you. Uh, Chris, uh, Razzmatazz is so much fun. I know everyone's going to love it. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thanks for having me, Hank. I appreciate it. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. The year was 1834. The month was December. I was 14. Irving's tale was by then well known. The characters of Brom Bones and the beauteous Katrina were widely understood in town to refer to my parents. Rumors persisted. I heard the name of Headless Horseman whispered. My father dismissed all these tales, calling them malicious. Yet more than once I saw him and my mother scanning Agatha's face across the supper table, finding only a secret smile and a look of defiance. I found the rumors fascinating. I followed Agatha like a pup, waiting for her to cast some magic spell. And one day, she did. The household servants had set a fire in the hearth for her comfort, and she sat close to it, counting out small gold coins upon a lap board. I hid in the shadows, hoping she might drop a coin and I could retrieve it for myself. One of her servants, a West Indian girl, carried a snowy log into the room and set it on the fire. It began to hiss and pop. The snow melted, and the fire sputtered out. Agatha cursed as I had never heard her do before. She stood, spilling all the gold, and slapped the idiot girl across the face. The girl ran, and my grandmother muttered to herself, searching for match and tong to no avail. 
when she was not looking, I crept forward and took for myself one of the gold pieces. Then something remarkable occurred. My grandmother sighed, knelt before the fireplace, reached for the logs, and her right hand caught a fire. Flame blossomed and coiled about her wrist. I gasped and cried out, Shh! Don't be afraid, my Dylan. Your hand! She raised her palm. Flame sat cupped in it, casting the shadow of her fingers upon the ceiling and walls. Lock the door, she said. I obeyed. She pointed to the floor, and I sat, waiting breathlessly. This is the Van Brunt gift. It will be your gift as well, soon, and your children's forever afterwards. Why does it not burn you? I asked. Why should it? Do I deserve to be burned? No. Then I am safe from the fire. Do you deserve to be burned, my Dylan? I shook my head. Show me. I reached for the flame and took it. I pulled back at once, crying out with pain, wagging my fingertips. The fire caught my sleeve. I could not rid myself of it, as if I clutched burning tar. The pain intensified. The blisters broke, and a rivulet of lymph ran down my arm. Your conscience knows, Dylan. You deserved to be burned. Say it. I deserved to be burned, said I. Again! I deserved to be burned! She turned her palm. The gold piece. I nodded and brought the stolen coin from my pocket. She took it and raised it to the light. You cannot wield the flame with guilt in your heart, son. Try, and it will devour you. Do you understand? I nodded. A Van Brunt should not be so weak. I'm sorry I took the gold, Grandmother. I'm sorry I was bad. Don't be ashamed of me. She frowned and laid the gold coin on her lapboard. She shook her head sadly. I'm not ashamed that you took the gold. I'm ashamed that you felt the guilt.